Hey everybody, it's me, Julie. On this channel, I usually make videos about publishing or approaching agents or writing query letters, so for this one, I decided to back up and go to the beginning of the writing process. After all, we can't really approach agents or think about publishing if we haven't actually written the book yet. So, uh, in my experience with looking at some of the work of uh, aspiring authors, I've noticed certain aspects of their writing that I end up having to talk about again and again, giving them certain advice on the actual uh, execution of their writing, some of the subject matter of their writing, some of the ways that they frame things, sometimes even grammar and punctuation. And um, I figured that maybe some of you can use some advice on some of the most common problems and some of the best advice I can give you for actually getting your book off the ground. First of all, I should say that every single one of you who has written a book needs to have at least one or two people read your book and react to it. And these do not have to be professional editors. In fact, it's probably better that they're not. Uh, they need to be people who will give you an honest opinion, however. So sometimes people who are writers find that the best uh, beta readers for them are other writers. That way, if you share your work with someone else who also has something to gain and something to lose from the reaction process, then uh, you'll kind of be in the same boat and you'll both be able to react honestly without um, saying things that won't be useful to each other. So if you don't have someone in your immediate circles who can perform this sort of uh, this task for you, then I recommend maybe joining a website or a forum that will allow you to search for a critique partner. You can try sites such as uh, CPSeq or the Absolute Right forums, or um, Critique Circle is one um, website you can sign up for. And also, I can't recommend highly enough um, entering contests where other aspiring authors are trying to win critiques or win a look from an agent or something like that. You can really make so many great writing buddies from these contests. And uh, I know a lot of people have managed to find really great critique partners through these. So that would be my recommendation. So, as an author who has reacted to dozens of amateur authors' work over the years, I've definitely noticed certain patterns, and I'm going to start with the stuff that you should make sure to avoid doing. Um, and these are very, very common mistakes that I've seen. First and probably most common mistake I've seen is info dumping on page one. This is when you have used your first crack at introducing your world and your characters to your reader on explaining the background, explaining the story, explaining what happened before page one. And you really need to rethink that if your first page and your first chapter, in fact, is all about uh, setting a scene. You need to get us invested first. And sometimes you can get away with in info dumping or at least filtering in the details more gradually later but you need to really think about your page one and what draws people in. And usually what draws people in is not uh, an interesting premise or uh, the background of your characters or innovative details about a fantasy world. It's usually character interaction or some kind of intriguing details about your characters, something that we can relate to. So you need to spend your first page and your first chapter, your beginning, getting us to care about the people or the situation that you're writing about. And, you know, then later on in the story, we'll probably sit still for details because we'll have been wondering about them. You can probably leave out more than you think you can. You need to learn to trust people and uh, get, us, get us wondering or get us to uh, pay attention so that we pick up very subtle details rather than expecting us to sit down and listen to you lecture to us because, um, um, and here's kind of a, a second point, is that a lot of authors seem to think that we're going to humor them. And you need to get that out of your head, that we're going we're gonna to sit still and listen to you. Because unlike in, say, school or a lecture, 
we don't have to be here. We can and probably will put your book down. So number two in my list is definitely don't get the idea in your head that we are going to humor you. Um, so we are going to want to be entertained. We're going to want that to be starting immediately. We're going to want to feel like we're in good hands. So um, if you have this feeling like we're going to we're going to sit still and wait for the story to get started, you're probably going to lose us. And number three on this same subject is uh, too many people mistake contrived conversations between characters or uh, you know, very uh, constructed first chapters where we can see something that's clearly introductory happening. But characters need to have natural conversations with each other. They shouldn't be standing on a stage reciting things to each other either that they both know or that are incredibly convenient for us to observe. They should never, these conversations or these introductory scenes should never feel like they're posed for us. Um, so yes, you need to think about what you want to present on your first page and get us engaged, but you need to avoid using cheap tricks like expository dialogue that isn't believable. It's wonderful if your characters can converse with each other and tell us something that's going to draw us in, but we need to not get the feeling that they're performing for us. And this can be a very difficult, very fine line to walk, but as I've said regarding this subject uh, many other times, if it was really easy to do, writing wouldn't be an art. So you've got to figure out some innovative way of getting us invested in your characters and in their situation uh, without making it really performative. And for number four of my list of things not to do, you need to make sure not to get too disconnected from your characters when you're telling us about them. So too often I read books that are really, um, they're disconnected from from what is happening. They're, um, they're very sterile. And what really gets a lot of people going, especially right at the beginning, is emotion. Um, sometimes first person narration is easier to do this with, but third person is not exempt from a disconnected, distant storytelling style. There are exceptions, of course, where the, the distance actually works for the type of story, but for the most part, you want to work on forging that connection ASAP. And um, unfortunately, some people mistake investment with action. Uh, of course, there's nothing wrong with starting with an action scene, but if you start with a battle and I don't know who I'm rooting for or I have no emotional investment in who wins it, I may just tune out and I'll feel like it's sensationalistic. So really what at the beginning you need to maybe feature emotion, feature maybe a conversation that conveys some kind of stakes, some kind of um, emotional consequences for these characters so that we can relate to them and we can understand who they are and we can root for them. Because too often we just passively watch someone perform duties or uh, sit back and observe them doing whatever they're doing with no idea of what's going through their head or why they're doing it. And um, then we just, we, we disengage. We don't get pulled in by first scenes like that. Going on down the list here, um, let's talk about more about openings. Um, I've seen um, on a lot of agents will write about things that turn them off immediately, and I read a whole series of agent blogs about uh, how common it is to use one of three or four really cliche beginnings. And just so you know, those tend to be either the character is waking up, the character was uh, describing a dream, the character is describing the weather uh, or the sky, something like that. And um, when you think about where you want to start your story, you need to begin where something is happening and you should avoid beginning with the mundane unless it's making it really clear that something not mundane is about to happen after this. So uh, again, don't feel like you're setting the stage. We should, when, when we go to a play, we don't sit down and then watch the stage people come in and put in all the props or paint the scenery. It's already there. 
when we sit down and the action starts, the conversations start. So maybe that's a good uh, metaphor for you to understand that uh, you need to filter in uh, the the scenery and what the what the objects that the characters are interacting in and the situation that they're in through letting us watch it rather than just telling us about it or watching you set it up we should never feel like we're watching you put it together before anything can start so choosing your opening is I mean it's 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 a delicate art but it is vital that you choose the right beginning and sometimes when you're writing a story, you kind of feel like you have to hammer out these details in order to know them yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that in first drafts. In later drafts, sometimes you can choose a different place to start your book. And you can take these details and figure out how to filter them in later more naturally. So sometimes, though, the beginning of a story can, it, it can really feel like the, the author is expecting us to watch them work out everything and you don't want to be that author we want to feel like we're in really good hands we want to feel like you already know what the story is what the what the environment is and uh, we're not watching you figure it out in front of us also on opening lines um, uh, you kind of can't go wrong with choosing a really awesome first line and then setting it on its own line or paragraph. It really stands out if you give us this, wait, what kind of opening. So uh, your mileage may vary with that, but, um, and similarly, uh, this may just be a personal pet peeve, but I tend to get really sick of stories that start with a bang, like some kind of action or the characters are in the middle of some kind of crisis and then halfway down the page, uh, the character announces that we're stopping here and it's backs up and says let me tell you how this started or I thought back to how we came to this position that really gets on my nerves because it feels cheap it feels like you know you started with action because somebody told you that you had to and then once you felt like you got us then you backed up that especially if it's only after half a page or a page it feels pretty cheap to me and um, so if you're if you're going to do that uh, I, I won't say you absolutely can't do it because it does sometimes work and there are examples in very successful literature of books that begin like that but be really careful about that because it does more often than not feel sensationalistic when you start with action and then you just back up to how we got here and last in the list of things that I feel like you should not do is the telling of characters' attributes. So many times, I can't even tell you, I have seen authors introduce a character and right about the same time that their name comes up, I'm told that they're good or they're scholarly or they've been a doctor for 10 years or uh, they take care of animals. And I would much rather see those things pop up in and a natural authentic situation so um, I recommend against telling us characters attributes instead of showing them and that sounds really cliche sometimes the show don't tell uh, advice that gets thrown around so much but it really is so much more effective if a character is seen with a ring on their finger that is scuffed by 10 years of wear rather than he had been my husband for 10 years you, you see what I mean there so you can you can usually find really innovative ways of revealing characters pasts characters personality traits characters um, interests or occupations okay and now I'm gonna give you just a few general tips on storytelling technique uh, first I will say um, make sure that you include characters for their personality, not for their function. I should never see a person existing in your story that only performs a function and seems to have no personality besides uh, what role they play or what job they do. Um, so people in your stories should always be more than their function. Next, I would say make sure that at all costs you avoid preaching. Like, if you have a book that 
primarily exists to forward some kind of uh, political or personal agenda that you have. You know, that's your business, but um, as soon as the characters start spouting your wisdom or the narration starts pounding home this, uh, this personal message or uh, ideological position on something, we can feel it and we will probably start to disengage even if we agree with you. So make sure that you're really careful if you have like a, a message in your book that it's not too overt and that you don't start to use your characters as mouthpieces for it because that's really obnoxious and a lot of people won't tune in for that. And here's something that I see all the time. I see people referring to characters who seemed sad or they looked angry, something like that. Uh, they looked puzzled, they appeared uh, upset. And I really, really recommend that you pull away from words like seemed and looked and appeared when you're talking about uh, observing what other characters are feeling or desiring. Um, describe what they do or describe how a person would end up interpreting that person as seeming that way. Uh, it doesn't all have to be emotions, but you can, you can describe facial expressions that suggest emotions. You can also use gestures, like if I say that somebody slammed their hand on the table, you don't need me to say that they seemed angry, because probably what they said and what they did is going to make it very clear that that person is angry. So you don't have to tell us that they said something angrily, you don't have to tell us that they're upset, you don't have to tell us that they seem any particular way. We're going to get that from them slamming their fists down. So, um, again, it doesn't have to be quite as obvious as that. It doesn't have to be a, a slammed fist. It could also be hesitation in the way that someone speaks. Or it could be uh, the person is doing something like um, moving their food around on their plate and not eating it. So clearly they're uncomfortable or they're distracted or they're not hungry for some reason that you can guess from the context of the scene. You can come up with all kinds of inventive ways of uh, telling how somebody seemed or what they might be thinking, and uh, the, based on how, uh, depending on how perceptive the protagonist or point of view character or point of view perspective is, uh, we, we may be able to glean what's going on in other characters' heads just from those actions. Now depending on the kind of story that you have, uh, you may or may not be able to use this one, but um, I like seeing when characters fail or lose at something. So that number one, we know that they can, and number two, that we feel some sense of triumph along with them when and if they do win at what they want. So we do need to know that your characters are fallible. We also need to see how they react to being fallible. That is, it's so incredibly useful and uh, helpful in understanding who these people are and getting us invested in them and understanding them as people in the story. So uh, you, you learn so much when you see somebody fail or uh, somebody uh, fall short. So I really recommend uh, including storylines that include your character not being perfect or uh, having a disappointment. It tells us a lot. And a word about pacing. Uh, I can be really guilty of some slow pacing in my work, so I should probably listen to my own advice on this, but I will pass it on for you as well. Uh, for the pace of your story to continue forward in a, in a reasonable manner, there has to be some kind of driving action, and uh, you can do that with a literal or figurative ticking clock. Uh, you can do that with some stakes that, you know, something, something will happen if your character doesn't act or doesn't win, and then those stakes increase, which will get us, not only get us more invested and care more about the success of your characters, but keep us turning pages. And also, uh, uh, on the same subject, if you end your chapters with some kind of tension at the end of them, that will keep us turning pages longer. It's, it, it can come off as maybe a cheap trick, but uh, leaving us on some kind of higher note where we're anxious to see where this goes, where it happens, uh, that's a, is a fantastic way to end a chapter or a, 
switch to a different perspective if you have a story that's like that. So uh, keeping it moving forward through um, us caring about what happens next is sometimes is um, it's as simple as having time running out or having uh, having something threatened. Oh, and that's another one is that if the protagonist has something that they really care about and uh, you want us to feel how desperate they are to, to, to win or uh, to succeed at what they're doing, um, threatening their, the thing that they value the most, uh, that's, uh, that, can be, that can be really helpful in moving the story forward. It creates tension, and uh, it it uh, it makes the, the the character fallible. So uh, I would just I would um, advise against using really overused ones, such as uh, kidnapping someone that the main character cares about, and that they have to go rescue them or something like that. Um, you might try uh, threatening their integrity or threatening. Um, their marriage threatens something that uh, that they could that they could regret losing, and uh, it doesn't always have to be a person or a thing that could be literally taken away from them. And then finally, in my beta reading for other people, the most common thing that I complain about is always the computational errors, the spelling, the grammar, the punctuation. So I'm going to share just a few of the most common things that I see uh, that I always have to correct for other people. And it's beyond just bad spelling or using the wrong homophones for the words that you mean. So uh, first off, dashes. You guys need to learn how to use dashes properly. There are actually two kinds of dashes and they're commonly uh, mixed up with hyphens, so there are three levels of these. The hyphen's the shortest, and the n dash is the medium size one, and the m dash is the longest one. You probably ought to look up punctuation manuals to explain to you how these things work. And uh, it's beyond the scope of this video for me to go into detail on uh, how to use dashes, but learn to use dashes, you guys. Another one is ellipses, the three dots that indicate a uh, missing text, hesitation, uh, stuff like that. Um, these three dots are supposed to have spaces between them. It's not just three next to each other. And it's uh, not more than three unless you've ended a sentence and then put three more after the end of the sentence which is correct, by the way, if you're trailing off on a sentence that is ended. So, um, ellipses, uh, there's, a, there's an ellipsis character that uh, most people are not using that in standardized manuscripts. Uh, the Chicago Manual of Style is the style manual that I think is probably most popular with at least uh, uh, publishers in the, in the West and uh, their standard is to have spaces before and between those, uh, those periods in a, in a set of ellipses. And on the subject of punctuation, I'm also seeing a fair number of people who are putting their commas or their periods outside of the quotation marks when they're doing dialogue, and that's, uh, that's not appropriate. Those belong on the inside of the quotation marks, and uh, there's, uh, there's also a lot of people who are mixing up their single quotes and their double quotes. I usually see people using double quotes for their dialogue like they're supposed to, but then they'll inexplicably use single quotes when they're referring to something like uh, the teacher's title was Administrator of Student Affairs and they'll use single quotes instead of double quotes and that's not appropriate either. You should be using double quotes for that. I don't know where that came from, but I'm seeing, I'm, I see that a lot for some reason. There are only very, very specialized uh, reasons why you would use single quotes if they're not inside of a set of double quotes. And uh, I should say, of course, that, that is, that's the convention for punctuation in the United States. There are a lot of other places that use kind of the opposite. They'll use single quotes for dialogue, and they'll use double quotes for, uh, for inside of dialogue if they're quoting something. So 
Of course, it's dependent on your country and your punctuation conventions that are used locally, but in the United States, I'm still seeing a lot of people using single quotes where they should be using double quotes. So, uh, and then finally, on uh, the subject of punctuation, I should say I see a lot of people misusing hyphens. There's no way for me to go into too much detail on how to use hyphens. It would be like a whole another video and I'm probably not even qualified to comment on it to the extent that it needs help but uh, I see a lot of people using hyphens where they shouldn't be using hyphens and a lot of people not using hyphens where they should be using hyphens. It's usually the latter versus the former but I see both of those things in the same manuscript and you probably ought to just look up the rules on hyphens and see if you're using them appropriately. Again, my favorite style manual is the Chicago Manual of Style, and it's used really widely, so you can't go wrong by using their conventions. Uh, however, hyphens and the little minute things that you use punctuation for, um, it's best to try to get them right, but they're not usually going to be a deal breaker for you. You're probably en going to end up having to use the, 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 the publisher's editor to get all of the house style correct if you should be so lucky as to get to that point. But um, it's, it's not going to kill you, but it's certainly the best thing that you can do to try to make everything as perfect as possible. You need to be as close to the full package as you can when you're submitting for publication. And I've, I've run into occasionally in the, in the amateur and aspiring author world uh, certain authors who think that that's not important, that the, the little things like spelling and grammar and punctuation are just not really important enough to worry about. But um, it is an important aspect of writing, and somebody is going to have to do it at some point. So when somebody says, this important aspect of the craft is just not my job, it makes you look unprofessional, and it certainly makes you less easy to work with. You want to do everything that you can to make your stuff look like it's going to be the, the least headache that it can be for a publishing industry professional if you want to be considered. Well, that about wraps up everything I have to say on this subject. For all you aspiring authors who are trying to get your books off the ground, and um, I don't know what my next video will address yet, but if you have something you'd like me to talk about, feel free to leave a comment. And uh, until next time, I wish you guys the best of luck drafting your stories and polishing them, and I'll see you next time.